So it's time to look at another classic time travel movie, this time a bit more fantasy than actual science fiction. This is one that I've only just recently watched for the first time, and I really liked the sound of it, but I will leave my final verdict till the very end. It's called Somewhere in Time, an adaptation of the novel Bid Time Return by Richard Matheson. The film was released in 1980, and it stars Christopher Reeve, Jane Seymour, and Christopher Plummer. This is a very unusual film for me to review, not just because it's more of a romantic drama, but because although I really liked some of the concepts depicted in the film, there's a few things, including the ending, that I really didn't click with. But nevertheless, if you're looking for an easy watch movie with a really unique twist on time travel, go and watch this movie now, pause this video, and come back to me after you've watched it. Okay, so welcome back. Now, Somewhere in Time tells the story of a young playwright named Richard Collier, played by Reeve, who is celebrating his new play, which just might be good enough for Broadway. The year is 1972 when the film opens. One evening, at a backstage party, he's approached by a mysterious old woman who hands him a pocket watch and tells him, Come back to me. She leaves immediately afterwards, and he's obviously taken aback by this. He's never seen this woman before in his life. The old woman goes back to where she's staying at the Grand Hotel nearby, and that evening she passes away in her sleep. Eight years go by from that moment. Richard is now working on a new play, but he's restless and disinterested in writing his latest play. So he decides to check in for a stay at the Grand Hotel. The porter, Arthur, an older gentleman, helps him with his luggage. Now, Arthur first came to the hotel with his parents when he was five years old. Arthur asks Richard if they've ever met before, because Arthur feels like he knows Richard. Richard is sure they haven't. Hmm, I'm sure that won't be a giant planet-sized bit of foreshadowing for later on. While waiting for the restaurant to open, Richard visits the hotel museum. And it's there that he discovers a photograph on the wall of a beautiful woman. This woman is Elise McKenna. Incidentally, the book that this film is based on, the author, Richard Matheson, had been inspired to write it after seeing a photograph of actress Maud Adams in the Opera House in Virginia City. Now, what's truly poignant about this photo becomes apparent later in the film. Richard becomes obsessed with learning more about this young woman. She used to act in plays that took place in a theatre on the grounds of the hotel back in 1912. So he begins doing some research into Elise, and he visits her photograph on a regular basis. He can't sleep, he's thinking about her so much. I have to say, it just becomes incredibly weird after a certain point. Like he's overcome by some kind of, well, madness. So he visits a local library and discovers that the last photograph ever taken of her, well, what do you know? It turns out she's the old woman who gave him the pocket watch and told him to come back to her. Well, now that can't be a coincidence. Something very timey-wimey must be going on here, methinks. He goes to visit an author, Laura Roberts, who had written about Elise's life. She had taken care of Elise in her final years and was her housekeeper. He shows her the pocket watch Elise had given him, and she's astonished and tells him that this pocket watch was very precious to her. She never let it out of her sight. Again, more foreshadowing. Elise died the night that she came home from the meeting with Richard eight years earlier. Laura tells him that something changed about Elise around 1912, after performing in a play in the Grand Hotel. She became more withdrawn and empty. Hmm. Something happened in 1912. She also shows him a photo of her manager, William Robinson. And then Richard notices that among Elise's personal items is a book called Travels in Time by Dr. Gerard Finney, who happens to have been Richard's philosophy teacher. <laughs> what are the odds of that? He goes to see Dr. Finney and asks him, Is time travel possible? He takes Richard aside and tells him an interesting personal story. 
He says a number of years ago he was in Venice staying in a very old hotel. He tells him that he was lying in his room one evening and all the sounds around him were all from the past. Everything in the room was from the past. He conceived a notion in his mind. What if he attempted to hypnotize himself and suggest to his mind that the year was not 1971 as it was when he was in the hotel, but was in fact 1571. He repeated a series of instructions in his mind over and over to convince himself it truly was that year. The most intricate details truly mattered. He felt as though he had travelled back in time for a fraction of an instant. He explains to Richard a few things to consider when attempting this. Objects around a person must not be from the present, or it will pull a person back to the present. This unusual time travel method can only work if the person only sees items and details around them that are from the specific period they are attempting to travel to. This is needed to disassociate the person from the present. So Richard goes to his room in the Grand Hotel wearing a period-specific costume and he removes all items in the room that are from 1980. He also makes sure that there's no coins in his pocket from 1980, important for later on. His first attempt is unsuccessful and he later goes to the attic of the hotel and finds proof that he had time travelled because his signature is written down on the guest reservation book from 1912, so obviously it worked. He's supposed to go back there. It's certainly the most unconventional form of time travel I've ever seen in a film, but hey. His second attempt is a complete success. He travels back to 1912, and he's actually there, and he obviously can't believe his luck. He meets a young boy playing in the lobby. It's Arthur, aged five. His father works at the front desk. It's all starting to make sense in terms of causality loops. He finally finds Elise near the hotel grounds by the lake. It's all very romantic and dramatic. She's been expecting him, but not because of time travel, but because her manager, Robinson, had told her that one day some young man would come along, as if Robinson knew things that were going to happen. There's an immediate intense chemistry between the two of them, but throughout the film, Robinson does everything he can to keep them apart. Robinson is determined to ensure that Elise's career can achieve its fullest potential and doesn't want any man to prevent that. Both Elise and Richard are obviously overwhelmed initially in each other's presence. There's some kind of unspoken connection between them. If I'm honest, and it's often the case in such melodramatic romance stories, Richard comes across a bit too forward and creepy at times when trying to get Elise to spend time with him. But as this is a love story, she folds to his intense advances and agrees to his pleas. She does clearly like him. Anyway, a nice montage of some scenes of Elise and Richard spending time together helps to forward their romantic narrative and establish a growing relationship. She tells Richard that Robinson told her that a man would eventually come for her. She says that Robinson knew a lot of things before they happened. Now, I don't know about you, but in a film involving time travel, that's a kind of major clue that suggests that there's more than one time traveller in the story. There's something truly mysterious about Robinson, and there are fan theories about who he is, and one of them, which I think should be self-evident, is that he is also from the future. Though his intentions for Elise are different to Richard's, he wants her to focus on becoming a superstar, and he believes this can only happen if she stays away from Richard. There's no indication as to when and where in the future Robinson is actually from. That's left up to the audience to ponder. Richard watches Elise perform and delivers some of her lines of dialogue as if speaking to Richard in the audience. Later, Richard sees a photo being taken of Elise. It turns out to be the very same photo where he first saw her in the hotel in 1980. And it just so happens that when the photograph was taken, she was looking at Richard. Imagine that, very poignant indeed. No wonder he was so taken by the photograph. Later he meets Robinson, who again tries to intimidate him, and he even has thugs beat him up. But before that, he tells him that he knew who Richard was, and that he knew he had come to destroy Elise. 
Richard thinks he's out of his mind, but technically Robinson is correct. Richard may not have intentionally come back to destroy Elise, but that is kind of what happens to a certain degree, because she becomes reclusive and never truly finds happiness, though she does find fame in later life. So long story short, Elise and Richard are spending time together and all seems well, they're at last happy. She teases him about his suit and he playfully tells her how great it is, how practical it is, including having pockets for coins. And it's at that moment he takes out a coin from 1979. This instantly begins to pull him back into the future. She screams out, calling his name and she and 1912 vanish from him. Richard awakens distraught and broken-hearted back in the present, his attempts to return to the past unsuccessful. Now, some fans have speculated that Robinson planted the coin to force Richard back to the future, but I don't think this makes any sense because, well, going by the rules of time travel in this story, simply seeing the coin would also send Robinson back to his time. So this is likely just a coin that Richard had in his pocket the entire time he was in the past, but he just didn't realize it. Richard stays in his hotel, catatonic and unresponsive. Arthur and another man from the hotel open his door and call for a doctor. Richard hasn't eaten for a week. Richard passes away in his hotel room, and his soul flies to heaven where he sees Elise waiting for him. They are, at last, together. Yeah, that ending didn't work for me either. It's pretty extreme and kind of dark. I'll need to watch the film again at some point, but I couldn't decide whether what Collier had achieved was akin to a kind of telepresence. Did he actually physically leave 1980 and travel back to 1912, or was he merely projecting his consciousness somehow? Well, he must have been there, I suppose, given that he had discovered his signature with time and date on the hotel guest registry from 1912 before he went back in time, meaning that he was predestined to alter history. So I guess that meant he did physically travel back through time. But there is another aspect of this film that's truly tragic, and I don't think many people really focus on it. Putting aside the lovey-dovey romance of it all, Richard's story is actually truly sad and a bit pathetic because he gets caught up in literally living in the past, unable to really connect with his life in the present day where he finds no real meaning or peace. And his obsession with a long dead woman from 68 years ago ultimately destroys him. I mean, it kills him. He could have found a woman in 1980 but he became entranced by a photograph that drove him down a path that destroyed him and negatively impacted upon Elise's life also. Sure, they did eventually meet again in the afterlife, but seriously, what a tragedy. I mean, starving yourself to death because of a broken heart is pretty extreme stuff. I'd argue that's mental illness at that point. I mean, it's not like he knew the woman very long. I suppose he thought he could never go back to her and he could never find her again, but there's a healthy and unhealthy way of dealing with grief and, well, suicide by starvation is obviously not the former. The problem with a lot of tragic romance stories is that the power of love is not necessarily always a force for good. It can lead people into destructive patterns in ways that really should have them committed, to be honest. Anyway, it's a movie. But what I really did like about this concept of time travel is the idea that the past still exists. Everyone who has ever lived and died is still alive somewhere in time, if only there were some means of reaching them. I'm fascinated by theories about backwards time travel and just what time is as a concept. The version of time travel in this film is one of the most unique and unusual I've ever seen presented. The idea that the power of our thought can influence our reality to such a degree that with enough sheer force of determination and belief, we can will ourselves to physically transport to another time and place. After all, where is the past now if not recorded and preserved in photographs, videos, and in our memories? 
our memories allow us to a certain degree to relive the past in a rather crude manner. With enough concentration and conviction, Richard Collier found a way back in time, and what follows is a memorable love story. Good performances throughout and a beautiful musical score, I'm putting this film somewhere in time on the recommended list. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.